Montgomery Community Media presents The American Promise, Immigration in Montgomery County. Sponsored by NEA Big Read. Featuring Montgomery County residents Frank Islam, Ola Sage, and Rimberto Rodriguez Sr. And your host, Steve Roberts. Welcome to the American Promise, immigration in Montgomery County. I'm Steve Roberts. Immigration has been a hot button issue on the national stage and living in such a diverse community right here in Montgomery County. We have our own stories to tell. That's what today is all about. We'll be talking to a distinguished group of immigrants who call Montgomery County their home. We believe that through discussion and listening to stories from immigrants here in our own region, we'll be able to gain some insight and inspiration from their particular experiences. Now let's meet our guests. Frank Islam uh, was born in India. He's a serial entrepreneur and author, emigrated to the United States in 1970 when he was only 15 years old. Currently heads the FI Investment Group, and in 2013, Frank was appointed by President Barack Obama to be the general trustee of the Board of Trustees of the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. Frank, welcome. Thank you. Next guest is Ola Sage. Uh, she's originally from Nigeria and she's Montgomery County, member of the Montgomery County Business Hall of Fame. Uh, and she moved here from Nigeria after receiving a scholarship to Calvin College in Grand Rapids, Michigan. That's a lot colder than Montgomery County, right? Um, soon after that, she moved here uh, and began studying information technology, which is her specialty. Currently, Ola serves as the CEO of cybersecurity firm CyberRx. Welcome. Happy to have you, Ola. Thank you. And uh, our other panelist, our third panelist, is Ray Humberto Rodriguez. He's born in Cuba. He's director of the Silver Spring Regional Center and the unofficial mayor of Silver Spring. We got a lot of people in the audience who want to talk to you about traffic lights and potholes uh, after this winter. He moved from Cuba at a young age and grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. Rianberto serves on behalf of the Montgomery County Executive and the County Council. His background includes community organizing, leadership development, civic participation, community design, urban planning, and he also teaches at the graduate level. Welcome. Reen happy to have you here. here. Thank you. I want to start with a couple of statistics, just to set the stage here. Most people don't realize, think of Montgomery County as this white, rich county. In some ways, of course, it is. But in other ways, it's very different from that. If you take the census definition of non-Hispanic white, which is kind of an odd definition, but non-Hispanic white, Montgomery County only 45% non-Hispanic white. Uh, Foreign-born one-third, you represent one-third of the entire population of the county that is foreign-born. Speaking a language other than English at home, 40%. So it's an, it's an astounding diversity that many people have, have no idea. Um, in fact, a, a recent a survey by a, a website called WalletHub listed the most diverse uh, cities in the country, in the whole country, number one, Silver Spring. Wow number two, Gaithersburg, and number five, Germantown. We have three of the five most diverse cities in the entire country. So um, this is the premise for the conversation. And uh, I want to ask you a simple question at first, your own stories and your own, um, your own journey. And uh, why did you move here? What drove you here? Rianberto, tell us why. Well, in a nutshell, um, my uh, wife and I had a midlife crisis. It hit us at the same time. <laughs> and so we were fortunate enough. Fortunately, <laughs> at the same time. Yeah. Living, living, having uh, grown up uh, in the South, in the Deep South, in Atlanta, Georgia, the opportunity presented itself professionally to come to the D.C. area. And as an urban planner, did uh, my research and found and saw how Silver Spring is the center of the universe. <laughs> and the, the, it is the type of community that we really wanted to raise our two children and our Meaning daughter. Meaning what? Why did you want to raise them there? Because it is a, an area where uh, lots of folks come from elsewhere, where, it can, where others are constantly teaching you and we're learning from others. And we really appreciate that, that vibrancy and that energy that that brings. Good, thanks. Ola, what brought you here? Honestly, I had not heard of Montgomery County in <laughs> Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, let alone in Nigeria. <laughs> right, let alone in Nigeria. But I came down here to visit a friend and really fell in love with the area because it felt familiar in a way. Right? In what way? In that uh, there were 
there were lots of different kinds of people, mm -hmm. and that felt comfortable. And uh, it was vibrant, there was a lot to do, and um, you know, I loved all the different kinds of restaurants, but that's another story. Well, that's, <laughs> but that's part of the diversity. It that's is. one of the benefits. It is. Yeah. So I think for me, it's more of why did I stay here as opposed to why did I come mm -hmm. here? Because I didn't make an intentional decision to, to live in Montgomery County, but I can't think of anywhere else I would want to live at this point. <laughs> Good. Frank, how did you wind up here? So my wife, Debbie, and I moved here in 1982 uh, because of three reasons. Number one is... Uh, uh, close proximity to Washington, D.C. Number two, that's where we had our jobs, and that's how we started the business. And the third thing is a very ethnically and culturally diverse community. And somebody mentioned the restaurant, which is a, probably an important uh, part uh, of our oh, bringing. Sure. Uh, so those are the reasons we moved here. We find this is a, a great place to, uh, to raise kids, and we don't have a children, but uh, we do have a lot of nephews and nieces. They go to school over here, and so, so that's the reason we came here. Now, all of you mentioned in one way or another the diversity, the familiarity, the sense of comfort that you, you, that you felt here. But why does it matter to the life of this community that it is so diverse and that so many people like you have been drawn here? What, what difference does it make? What impact does it have, Frank? Uh, first of all, uh, we need to embrace the richness of our diversity. Diver diversity brings us together. Diversity makes us stronger. And when we're stronger, we're together, we can help shape a better future for America. We can also build a stronger, fairer, just, and tolerant America. Um, and it's not just the, eth uh, the ethnicity and the culture, it's the, it's the gender. It also brings the ideas, first perspective, and first thoughts. Ola, what, from your point of view as a businesswoman and having lived here now, what difference does it make that this place is uh, one-third foreign-born, 40% speak a language other than English at home? Well, in business, I always used to say nobody has the monopoly on good ideas or great ideas. And, and I think, you know, my own personal experience, even though I was born in Nigeria, which is majority, you know, black, <laughs> um, I attended school with kids from all over the world. Hmm. And so that was my personal experience. Hmm. And the richness of that, I think, is what has informed how I view um, diversity in, in having not just ethnic diversity, but diversity in thought, diversity in culture, diversity in religion. Um, and I value that because it gives you an opportunity to learn. Mm -hmm. Roberto? Uh, the opportunity to learn and the educational uh, adult learning uh, uh, opportunity to uh, uh, mingle with people from elsewhere it really enriches you. And we have found that uh, walking around Silver Spring, uh, and well, yes, the restaurants again, <laughs> and, 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 and starting a conversation with anyone uh, around, it's, it's likely that their, their life story uh, is, is it's as exciting as yours, if not more, and that just really enlivens. I'd like some specific examples, if you can think of some. One that struck me recently having just received two new knees at a Montgomery County hospital. Um, uh, it struck me that if you took every foreign-born woman of color out of Montgomery County hospitals, they'd close overnight. They'd close overnight. It, it couldn't possibly operate without that workforce. So, so give me an experience in your own life that can reflect the real life, day-to-day, Work-a-day contributions that immigrants make to this community. On the way over here, um, uh, a neighbor from Silver Spring and I uh, decided to come up on, on Lyft, and and of course uh, our Lyft uh, driver uh, was from Trinidad Tobago. Tobago. And not only that, he happened to live like a block from us. When we called <laughs> him up, he was there in 35 seconds. Uh, and, and hope you got his card. <laughs> absolutely, we did, and, we're, and we are going to engage him in some yeah, community sure, activities. Right. So I think that's a, a simple example of, of, of the richness of, that is Silver Spring. Let, let me uh, share some thoughts with you about the Im immigrants uh, in terms of bringing the broad base of the uh, what I consider the benefits to our economy. Uh, let me give you some examples to illustrate my points. The 35% uh, of Silicon Valley is founded by the new immigrants. The 83% of the America's top high school, the, the science students are the children of immigrants. 
they are the future leaders, the future entrepreneurs, future scholars, and future, uh, future uh, leaders. In addition to that, 32%, if I remember correctly, of the high technology firms, the CEO of foreign born. So, and they create, according to the statistics from the due research, uh, from one of the research studies that I've seen in San Francisco, Carnegie, I think, create something like a 80 to $90 billion a year revenue, as well as creates the millions of jobs. 11% of our economic growth is dependent on immigration, on immigrants. And what, give me an example from Montgomery County, sure. uh, Ola. That, uh, Silicon Valley, you're absolutely right. I know those statistics, but it's, it's important here too. I was just driving out 270. It happened, there wasn't many cars on the road for some strange reason. <laughs> and um, there's a big sign, 270 Technology Corridor. Well, if you went into any one, of those research firms, you They're went into any one of those universities, a high, a high percentage of the people working there w will be immigrants. So, right. so talk about that. I, there are two examples that come to mind. One is in the tech area, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it's both an opportunity and a challenge because we just can't find enough um, t um, tech um, skilled workers. Yeah, skilled workers in this in this area, and um, I think the immigrant community is contribu contributing greatly to that. Um, in terms of helping to, to close the gap. But, you know, the other one that came immediately to mind, it always all revolves around food <laughs> for me. <laughs> but think about all the different at restaurants in Montgomery County, ethnic restaurants. If those went away, like you talked about the nurses going away, what would we have? What would we be left with, you know, in terms of just choices and options? So both in terms of the types of, uh, of restaurants and food um, um, venues that are available, but the, entre the entrepreneurs behind those restaurants, right, um, I think add just immensely to and the And you community. know, another sector that is enormously important when I mentioned 270, um, there are communities in Gaithersburg and, and, and farther out that are increasingly Asian. There are, yes. there are elementary schools in Montgomery County where the population is half Chinese and I just said 83 percent of the uh, top yeah. high school students are children of immigrants. And yes. um, the, the Chinese contribution is a particular interest mm -hmm. in the high-tech mm -hmm. sector and the medical sector Absolutely. and the University the National Institutes of Health, which of course is mm -hmm. a very important part of mm -hmm. our, our community. Um, Rianberto, what's, what's your sense of, of this? Give us a, a, any other examples you can think of that well, will put a face on, on well, this. Well, here's the, and, uh, I think the, the I, the idea of uh, restaurateurs and entrepreneurs at the grassroots level. You guys don't uh, want to talk about food. No, <laughs> fine, but, but, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's <laughs> fascinating to see in Silver Spring yeah, a, redeveloped, a redeveloped area that when no one else would invest in an uh, area of Silver Spring uh, on the southern part of Fenton Village, the, it was the really the, the entrepreneurship of, of immigrants, in this case predominantly Ethiopians, mm -hmm. that came in when no one else would and, and put their life savings and their family savings into a restaurant, into a coffee shop, and, and made that place seem and work like a community. And now you go by there and you see the, the, the mega developments around, but it's in, in a large part due to the, to, to the heart and soul and hard work of that Ethiopian community that yeah, came in. Yeah, it's a, it's a good example. Uh, I write a column for Bethesda Magazine, which I use to profile a lot of immigrants and a lot of the diversity. And I was doing an interview with Ethiopian long distance runners. There's a whole community of some of the best long distance runners in the whole world from Ethiopia, they're political immigrants often, mm. from political persecution in right. Ethiopia. And I was interviewing a, a group of them at the Panera Bread right there in the middle of <laughs> Silver Spring. And I looked around and every table, some it, the group was speaking a different language. <laughs> and, you know, right there in the middle, of, it was but a perfect embodiment of what we're talking about. But they shared a common bond and that bond is the immigrant's journey. Yes, sir. They have their story to tell. I want to give you one more statistics before uh, uh, there are about one million jobs open in the high school areas and manufacturing jobs, and we we have a more jobs than we have the workers. Yeah. And we cannot fill those jobs. As a result, we are losing our competitiveness uh, in in uh, in the world. So so that's another aspect of that. So immigrants makes the community stronger, vibrant, and resilient, and 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 they contribute so much economically 
that they, they are the part and parcel of the socioeconomic particle fabric of this nation, well, this there's community. Well, there's another issue. Uh, there's been a lot of attention to the visible entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley, you know, the Jerry Yangs and the... Uh, well, it's not. It's, it's, it's the Google, it's the Microsoft, course, it goes right. on and That's on. That's right. Apple. But uh, uh, there's another fact that I'd like you guys to talk about. Uh, and that is that uh, Fred Hyatt, the editorial page editor of the Washington Post, has been writing a lot about this. That uh, if you look at the demographics of America, Montgomery County or anywhere else, and the aging of, uh, as baby boomers retire, uh, one of the great economic contributions that immigrants make is their younger, Young hardworking, tax-paying right. members of the community who help finance the retirement benefits for that aging workforce. Good way. And Fred Hyatt points out that in a country like Japan, you can see what happens mm -hmm. when you don't have mm -hmm. that young immigrant workforce to pay the taxes to uh, pay off those uh, obligations, the retirement obligations. You, uh, uh, create an enormous problem. So talk reimbursement about Well, actually, about as, as you're saying that, I, I'm picturing the, um, a brewery in, in, the, in downtown Silver Spring where <laughs> you go at any, any given evening on, on weekends and, and the young people you see there um, are, are m most are, are immigrants or, or sons and daughters of, of, of immigrants. And those are the, uh, those are the young people moving into uh, the apartment boom in Silver Spring, and those are the, and then when they have kids, those are the people buying homes uh, around Silver Spring and around this this whole area. So it it is that those twenty something, thirty something, and at this point, it's impossible for me, of course, not to uh, put a, a plug in here for all those dreamers that have contributed all that, mm -hmm. all 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 their lives to to helping build in this case Montgomery County, and 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 their efforts to do this as well. It is true that Montgomery County is home to a very significant population of undocumented young people um, as it, well as... Yeah, uh, you're talking uh, about the DACA, the Dreamers. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and Montgomery College is, is an institution it's which has been critical in providing a bridge for a lot of these young people. Can, to can I just future. add also that while it's, yes, they're young immigrants that are, the, that are contributing, but it's also the entrepreneurial spirit. So yes. Yes. they're not yeah, just coming in and, and just settling mm -hmm. for whatever they mm -hmm. can get, but it's aspiring and, and, and looking to create not just wealth for themselves, but also to create jobs for others as well. Now we've talked a lot about the positive side of immigration and the contributions are enormous, but you've also mentioned uh, these young people that have children, they're going to schools, uh, they're using municipal services, mm -hmm. as you are very well aware in Silver Spring. What's the cost here? It's not all positive. What's the, from the point of view of someone who works from the, for the county of Umberto, what is the burden here? Is, is, is the schools that have to teach children with dozens of foreign languages? How Quite does that the contrary. Uh, there, there is no burden in immigration. There, we, we're looking at a community that enriches in these schools where multiple languages are spoken. Uh, it's, it's, it's welcomed. I mean, we, we're one of the few countries where being, being uh, uh, monolingual is, is the thing to be. You travel the world and, and every young person is, is trilingual. And here in, in, in Silver Spring and Montgomery County, what a wonderful opportunity uh, we have I'm for that. I'm not yeah. the, uh, arguing with the cultural benefit. I'm asking you to talk about the real life cost. If you have to employ extra uh, uh, teachers in the school, if you've got students who come in who don't speak English and require special remedial help, there's a cost there. The, 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 it's, it's an investment, not a cost. To look at it as a cost is, is <laughs> really a, a disservice to the long-term But vitality. it has an impact on your budget. Absolutely, 51% of Montgomery it's County's budget. It's a long-term long investment. Yeah, same. okay, I understand that. 51% of Montgomery County's budget goes to the schools. And, and having said that, we have a, a, an inherent uh, it, it message from our leadership, from from county executive to, to the college, that this is a welcoming community and that we see this jointly, all of us, and the business community as an investment, not a burden. Uh, do you One want more answer? statistics I wanted to add. Uh, uh, <laughs> the, uh, something like a 20 to 23 percent of the, uh, the new recruits on the military and the army, they are the 
first generation immigrants. Right. Yeah, no, it's a very is, important so part. Which is a very important part of that, yeah. in addition to making sure that we said that we are growing workforce and they, they bring the skilled workforce and we need their talent because they're young and skilled. Well, one good example of that, of course, was the Khan family in Silver yes. Spring who raised yes. their sons in, in Silver Spring, who, of course, became very well known. Their son joined the military, was killed in Iraq, and their father spoke at the Democratic Convention. You talk about Kizir Khan? Kizir Khan, yeah. and who has a new book out about his yeah, journey. And, um, uh, and they, they came to Silver Spring mm. for all the same reasons you have described, because mm. I've interviewed them and written about them. Because they, he, he, Mr. Khan talks about standing on the um, subway stop in Silver Spring mm -hmm. and going to work and seeing the range of colors and the range of languages mm -hmm. and saying, I like can, a rainbow. Yeah, I can feel comfortable <laughs> here. Um, and that's why he raised uh, his kids in Silver Spring. But in addition to schools, um, there have to be other services, hospitals, healthcare services, yep. others, that feel a certain strain when you get a, um, the kind of influx, which, again, we, we're proud of it, we relish it, we want more of it. But there has to be some strain. To uh, it. Uh, yes, there is strain, and not but. When you accompany that strain with with empathy and with with services like the Gilchrist Center, where where immigrants come and and feel welcome and and can improve their uh, their skill set to 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 be a contributing part of the economy. When when you accompany in in, in in businesses with the with the support for new entrepreneurs, regardless of of, of their original skill set, and add to that the 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 value of of in in the predominantly Latino community of the workforce in the construction, mm -hmm. landscaping uh, mm -hmm. services, uh, modest to low skill, yes, and uh, the they clearly put more into the system than the system pays uh, to them. So, so it's, there, there is no, uh, I think in Montgomery County, we, we are from the top down, we have a r very clear message that immigrants are a plus, not a burden. Well, then the statistics certainly show that, but that doesn't mean that there's a balance sheet here, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, municipal services can get strained. And when people are first coming here, uh, of course, there's also a vibrant uh, a private community in Montgomery County that helps resettle refugees. A lot of faith-based organizations are very active here, in, including uh, increasingly a mosque and um, and the churches. Church the churches also welcome very, people very from all welcoming. over the world. Uh, but we should also give a shout out to, uh, to one of our sponsors, which are the public library. Yes. Mm -hmm. Of of all of the institutions, you know, if you land in Montgomery County from Ethiopia or Nigeria or wherever, the next day you can walk through the door of a public library in this county get a computer, start to uh, make contacts with the kind of community. Uh, and they start learn, to learn the language because they do have a barrier of the language. People don't realize how... Uh, um, <laughs> good job. Uh, <laughs> people don't realize how critical libraries are to this process they, they of They play a pivotal role in, Absolutely pivotal. in educating people. Yeah. In, in, in some ways, to many immigrants, uh, uh, particularly from Latin America, where there isn't a strong tradition of libraries, uh, it's libraries are like, wait a minute, you mean I can walk in there and borrow a book? Uh, and, and, and I don't it, have to pay? It, yeah, it, that's it, a, that's in, a, in my own personal case, landed in the middle of Georgia, in the middle of nowhere, in, in 1968, and it was through the old-fashioned uh, bookmobiles from the yeah, public yeah. libraries that helped me uh, uh, learn English. So, so the libraries are... In, in addition to the library, I want to also add, and we have some people here at Montgomery College, it's a very ethnically mm -hmm. rich, diverse uh, set of the immigrants who just come over there to learn the skills to get education. They, they, they all do not go to get a PhD. They don't need to because the fact that they can get a two years college, they can, and they become a very important a contributor to our economy because they become a part of the 21st century workforce okay. because they have the skill and knowledge and experience. And, and we have to, we have to support the Montgomery College, and my wife and I support also financially. Also, we have a Frank Islam Athenium Symposia where we bring the people from all over the country who's the, uh, to talk about politics and the business and some other things as foreign policies. Now, Montgomery College is, is they play a very pivotal role. I was I was speaking there just a few weeks ago, a group of students and faculty members, and I asked the students, "How many of you?" 
uh, were either uh, born abroad or had a parent born abroad, 98 percent. Mm -hmm. Raise their hand. So, so can I, I'd, I'd like to say, you know, I assume we all love Montgomery County, <laughs> but there is an investment. <laughs> And just on, on the business end, I think what I've appreciated is that investment, right? Because sometimes, particularly when people come and have uh, challenges with language, that can be a challenge for them in terms of getting employment, right? Um, and, and so I appreciate the investment that Montgomery County has made in whether it's English as a second language, getting, you know, um, being intentional about helping immigrants kind of transition or um, mm -hmm. um, as assimilate in, into our economy. I think so that has helped us as a business to be able to have access to more talent. And a skilled workforce. You know. Yes. Yeah, you're right. Well, you know, when you mentioned a skilled workforce, I gave a lot of statistics about Montgomery County. And, um, and one of the ones that uh, is most striking to me is the education level here. Uh, and, it, the, and the earning level as well. Well, the earning it, 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 Montgomery County is the 11th wealthiest county in the country. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, uh, just, just out of the top 10, <laughs> it's number 11 at the moment. But in terms of education level, yes. it's one of the top in the country. I looked at, for instance, if you look at bachelor's degrees in Montgomery County, 58% of the people in Montgomery County have at least a bachelor's mm -hmm. degree. That is twice the national average. Uh, PhDs, it's even a mm -hmm. bigger. Uh, well, it's also the close proximity of the federal government workforce, which, the, which it also contributes to that. You know, another area to the that income as well as to the uh, to the skilled workforce. Yeah. Yes, I was just going to add in the research field, immigrants have a huge contribution. That is uh, true. From all over the world, so it's not even necessarily just kind of concentrated with, let's say, Asia, or it's mm -hmm. literally around. So we have NIH in our backyard, mm -hmm. um, and you have researchers literally from around the, the world. The Institute of Cancer? Yes. And, yeah. and I, I, one, of the columns, one of the columns I did for Bethesda Magazine was about a man named Charlie Sun, who uh, recently born in China. We're sitting in the Woodside Deli uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in Rockville, and he pulled out his phone, and he said, I, there's an there's a, uh, app called WeChat or WeChat, which is Chinese language app that Chinese expats all over the world uh, uh, use, and he said, I, I, he said, every day I'm in touch with Chinese scientists all over the world. Mm -hmm. Now this guy is also a uh, works at N NCI, National Cancer Institute. He's not a doctor; he's a software engineer mm -hmm. who creates the software to support the cancer researchers. Mm -hmm. It's a perfect example of the contribution mm -hmm. on the high end mm -hmm. uh, that, as you point out, uh, the researchers and scientists make here. Um, but you know, he told me this great story. He said, because this is worldwide app is so uh, instantaneous and so efficient, uh, that he one day he looks and he sees that there's been an explosion in a factory in his hometown back in China. And his parents live in this town. So he calls and says, are you all right? Are you all right? They hadn't heard about the explosion yet. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he already knew about sitting, it. Sitting <laughs> in the Woodside Deli in Rockville, he heard, about the, he heard about the explosion before his parents did in their hometown. And this kind of, this is another dimension of the immigrant experience today, in that the technology allows these people not just to work in Montgomery County, but to be in touch with a worldwide network right. of scientists, yes, researchers. Yes. And, and in fact, we say technology helps level the playing field, right? That is right. true. Uh, a lot of uh, 25 to 30 percent of the Nobel laureate uh, are foreign born in this country. Yes, true. Let me ask you another question, though. Have any of you, uh, we've been so complimentary, but I, there always is another side in terms of the immigrant experience, um, and that is discrimination. Any of you ever faced incidents of discrimination here? I think that the, uh, we all have to uh, say that the, Im the, the immigrants confront hostility, prejudice, and discriminations, and also they face the language barrier, education barrier. They're also not part or parcel of the American enterprise. They're labeled as uh, outsiders, and they also start from the bottom rung of the ladders in order for them to climb the ladders. Uh, and they also disc get a disc they have they have been discriminated to get a job also. Those are the facts. But have you ever run into discrimination here? Uh, I'd rather uh, not say that. I personally not, because my journey. Members of your family? Uh, no, my family. Uh, well, my uh, this country needs uh, those strong, vibrant, and skilled workforce. So they all 
Asian, and as a result, they are either doctors or engineers or business people. <laughs> and that's part of their gene and the DNA, so they never felt hostility and prejudice at all. But the low skill workforces in this country do face, and we need them in retail industry, in the landscape, in the, in the, also in the construction business, and, the, and, the, and the also in agriculture. So they, they also contribute to our economy, so we have not forgotten them. We should never forget them. As a woman of color, have you ever run into discrimination? Of course. Give me some examples. But, this, mean, is, this is part of the fabric of the immigrant I, experience. I, we can't deny I it. I mean, discrimination occurs on it, it's in, it can be religious discrimination, it can be cultural, it can be gender, it can be professional. All of the above. It can be all of the above. It can, I don't like the suit you're wearing. It can, you know, it can be um, a lot of, but I think we're human, right? Um, and, and so I think um, that just comes with the territory of being human. I don't necessarily think that it is unique to immigrants, right? Sure. People discriminate against non-immigrants as well, and and so I don't see that. Um, I do agree that perhaps, and, and again, even you were talking about lower levels, or you know, you know I, I'm not sure how you characterized it, but coming in and working at some of the lower wage mm -hmm. positions might and with less education, with less, less education, might. Yeah. But I also think that that happens. You know, I came here on an academic scholarship, but that doesn't exclude. You know. Um, uh, human, human behavior from... Give me an example. So I remember um, I was sitting in a, in a college lecture and there was a visiting professor from South Africa. This is, you know, while apartheid was still uh, happening. Live and well. Yes. And um, in this particular gathering, I happened to be uh, probably one of maybe two <laughs> non you know, um, Caucasian uh, students. And it was a f fantastic speech, and I mean, he opened up for questions. And, um, and I, so this was, I don't believe it was personal because the person didn't know me, mm -hmm. but they said, you know, they were going, would you ever want to be ruled by a black person? And I thought, oh, wow, <laughs> I, I'm here. <laughs> Can you see me? <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so, so that wasn't necessarily personal in terms of the person knew me, but it still felt personal, right? Uh, um, let let absolutely. me also say that the, through the century, the new wave of immigrants always faced hostility and prejudice. Uh, as a matter of fact, not too long ago, before 1960, President Kennedy was the first Catholic president. And he says that, and, he, and they did not accept him as a president of the United States. And, and he came out and said that the attack on one faith is attack on all faith. And he also said that I am victim today, tomorrow you will be the victim. Same thing with the Irish Catholic, Italians. The list goes on and on. Even 1632 on a ship Arabala, John Winthrop came to our shore to establish the Bay Colony. He faced the discrimination he, in this country as well. So it has been for many, many centuries. Uh, What's well, your I'll tell you what, as a, um, as a white Latino, it's, um, I'm keenly aware of, of discrimination. And um, a, also, by the way, married to a, uh, I'm not a PhD, but my wife is, <laughs> a, a, a Latina uh, PhD. I, I, I know uh, about uh, high, uh, marrying high achieving women. So, yeah. so, <laughs> so, so the stories there, there uh, abound. Uh, I, um, I must say much less in Montgomery County, but not void. Uh, the, 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 ugly, the ugly realities of, of racism are, are here as, as anywhere else. Uh, I've experienced it mostly in situations and examples like, um, again, being, being white when other, when people in position, white people in position of power may approach me and say, yeah, but you're not like them. And I say, wait, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, what do you mean? I'm not like them, uh, and and that that hurts and deep and, and hurts uh, deeply in the community in Montgomery County, where the vast majority of Latinos are from El Salvador, uh, Guatemala, Central American, and and so that that hurts. That hurts. Uh, what are the special? Uh, the, the Hispanics are probably the single largest immigrant group in Montgomery here, although. There are many from Africa, many from many Asian Asia. Americans. And, I mean, probably the, the, the second largest. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I, I looked at the statistics, <laughs> and I mentioned that only 45% of the county is non-Hispanic white, 19% um, African American, 19% Hispanic, 15% Asian. So, 
the, the distribution of uh, immigrants is, is quite wide. But uh, the Hispanic community, as you point out, is, is particularly visible and, of course, particularly the subject of a lot of political discussions. It's not a political conversation, no, no. but they are subject of... Well, the, the, reality, the reality is that Montgomery County, because of the leadership, it has, has been very welcoming to that community. And we have, a, for example, a, a police force that is respectful, has enlisted the trust of the community, and people know this, and this gravi people gravitate to a place where they, they, they uh, not perfect, but we establish a trust among that commu uh, um, between the community and the police in particular, and that's so critical, particularly in this, in this time, time, time and age. One thing about the Hispanic population in Montgomery County, very different from the Indian American, very different from the African, West, predominantly West African and African community, is most Latinos in Montgomery County are of lower educational attainment. And, and that, that poses a, a, a series of, 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 of challenges that, that does m merit uh, per particular investments again. And, and, and it, is, it is the, disproportionately the leadership of Latinos is, is non-Salvadorian and non-Guatemalan, but that's only a matter of time. I think we, 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 have a, we have a really strong Salvadorian and Guatemalan, by the way, the, the uh, Salvadorian Guatemalan consulate shows when it was uh, uh, embassies, when it was time to set up an embassy, you know where their consulate, uh, consulate, their consulate is in Silver oh, Spring. <laughs> so, so the future of those two communities both both great, but it is going to be continuing work. But that is part of what I was saying earlier about the strain it puts on the community institutions, the public schools, uh, when you do have uh, an immigrant community of lower educational level, you know, a PhD uh, Indian scientist or Chinese scientist coming in and working at NIH is not putting a big strain on local services, but uh, but, but the lower educated no, uh, but they don't put us. I mean, we need them all. We need people to for, to clean yeah, the streets to, to, and to, we to need the PhDs as well as yeah, uh, to be One of the yeah. things that they, uh, Steve wanted to point out that America is still a country of inclusion and openness. There is no country in the world that my story can happen in America can only happen in America. The story of Obama being a person in the United States it can only happen in America is the strength and the values and qualities of America about the inclusion and openness that all of us should continue to proudly and truly embrace. Yeah, but I, I do. I, mm. Yes. <laughs> um, I was just going to say that, you know, I'm, I'm a participant of Leadership Montgomery. And one of the things that we had to do this year was a ride along with the police. And that just blew my mind because talking about the diversity, to see the diversity in the police force in Montgomery County, I don't think I've seen anything like that um, in, in a lot of cities in the United States. And I, I don't know if that's, but I just, I was very proud, you know, uh, as, as I rode and I, I walked in and I saw Asian policemen. You know, they represent the community. Yes, representing the community, <laughs> and I just thought want. that was a fabulous it's, 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 thing. It's, it's essential, a, and they represent the best of the humanity. Now, we've all been discussing all of the virtues of Montgomery County and its welcoming institutions, welcoming leadership, which we all agree on. But we live in a country uh, uh, with an administration that ran for public office with a decidedly anti-immigrant mm -hmm. message uh, that can't be uh, denied. Uh, nor can we deny, as you pointed out, Frank, that um, uh, anti-immigrant sentiment has been a major factor in American history. The current uh, president and the current attitudes recur periodically. Mm. Virtually every immigrant group has faced discrimination, whether the Irish Catholics, whether the Italian, uh, Jewish? The, Jews, the Jews that uh, 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 my, my people, the Japanese, the Chinese, it, historically, Periodically, there have emerged these xenophobic leaders and these xenophobic attitudes. And I want to go to some questions from the audience, including this first one, which is reflects to some extent that, that uh, context we're talking about tonight. How will our country's current immigration attitudes affect the next generation of immigrants? Is America diminished as a destination? So, you want me to? Sure. So, uh, this administration, uh, obviously, very much anti-immigrant, and here are some of the things that their policy is. It, it has played the political dividend, but it would not play, it will not do anything with the economic dividends. 
there are 25% of companies in America have relocated to the Canada uh, to the foreign to the to the overseas because they cannot find the skilled workers because of the because of the uh, what this administration has done. So this is what they have done: is uh, get rid of the family visa, get rid of the diversity visa, reduce the uh, immigration illegal immigration by 25%, and the most important thing they have done is it is increase the visa for the skilled workforce and also for the labor. Uh, for the agriculture labor. That has a strong effect on the people coming to our country as a student. So what happens, the, especially the people in the high school information technology, the computing area, come from India and China. They come from on a student visa, which is everyone visa. Then they get a job, they convert to non-immigration visa. And then the company hired them because, because uh, they're a skilled workforce. Right. And this is how they get their immigra immigrant cards. Now, the question, though, was, what impact in Nigeria, in West Africa, in Latin America, will the, the current uh, hostility voiced by the leadership of the country have on the next generation? Well, I think you made the point that there have been, um, there have been ebbs and flows in this, right? There have been periods where it's, the sentiment is heightened and then it quells a little bit and goes up. And, and my own personal view is as long as America is seen as the land of opportunity, I think people will still want to come um, and will come. And, you know, nothing lasts forever. And so this too shall pass. And, <laughs> this and, so, and some, and, you know, whatever the it is. And, you know, I think, you know, we live in a bubble here in D.C., right, <laughs> in the DMV as we call it. And so there's a view of how we view immigration versus anti-immigration, et cetera. And then there's the middle of the country, and then there's the, the two east and west coasts, et cetera. So, I, you know, rather than kind of focus on, you know, is, is will this, is this quote unquote anti immigrant uh, sentiment, sentiment um, the driver? I think it's really the opportunity that will inform the choices that people but make. But we are hearing yeah. statistics that there is a significant decrease, yes, particularly in illegal immigrants. It is yeah. totally. I mean, illegal it's, or legal? It's, uh, uh, yes, there, legal? Are, there may legal? be at the current time some decrease, but I like that. This too shall come to pass, probably sooner rather than later, right? So <laughs> when w w at two, four years of this mess, you know, we can <laughs> overcome. So, but in, in throughout Latin America, uh, I, uh, I, I can reflect on my own country, Cuba, having visited, uh, you talk to anyone and everyone, and people continue having that aspiration of potentially coming to the United States mm -hmm. one way or another. Mm -hmm. And they do this without dissing or, or distracting from the situation of having to make their own, their own country better. So I, I don't I don't think this is going to have yeah, any. Yeah, and, and I was just going to say, you know, the immigrants that I know who've come here, they didn't come here because of politics. You know, they came here for a better life, a better way, et cetera. And so, I, I just it's not it's not on the Maslow equivalent hierarchy of needs kind of thing where they're going to say, well, I'm not going to come now because now if they're not able to come, that's a different that's issue, the, that's right? The, that's the problem. If they're being that. denied entry into that's the United correct. States, but the desire to come yeah, I is agree. still that, there. Uh, let me ask another question from the audience. Uh, could you please share an obstacle you had to overcome that defined the moment you were here to stay or the moment you had to embrace America? What was the moment you decided to stay? I decided to stay when I got the opportunity to go to school, get the scholarship, and then they gave me the, uh, I have always wanted to be a business owner, so they gave me the opportunity to become an entrepreneur. So that's the reason I decided to stay here. Any personal moments of crystallized, well, you say, well, this well, is now my home? Well, I, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> When I got married. <laughs> 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 Tends to have a big impact on most of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you married an American. Yes. And that yes. really sort of defined Absolutely. your future. Yeah. Uh, Did you meet him in Calvin College? He, you were the only Nigerian there. No, 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 no. It's an Arthur Murray story. <laughs> <laughs> no one under the age of 78 knows who Arthur Murray was. I'll, I'll go to that. Uh, well, that'll be the you're at a dance. You were at a dance. <laughs> you never watched the American President, Six Lessons, Arthur Murray? No, I'm telling you, Arthur Murray was, you know.
<laughs> Arthur Murray was old when yes, I was a yes. kid. Yes, but the dance, the dance studio is still exists. Dance studio. Yes. <laughs> Good. No, I, 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 uh, in, in, in my situation, I, I came over as a child without my parents. I didn't have the choice of huh. neither coming over. Uh, and as I grew uh, older, I, it was, um, I had, like many Cuban Americans, uh, uh, taken the rear view mirror and thrown it out. So it was, going back was never an option. And, and visiting only became possible after uh, President Obama reestablished diplomatic relations. Yeah, that was true of, of my people too. They came from Russia and Poland and never looked back. Never looked you know, back. There were Cossacks back there <laughs> right. who were trying to kill them. So they didn't uh, uh, look back with any fondness at, at all. Uh, but the immigrant experience is a little different today from China, from India, not only because, or from, from Europe, not only because if you're not a political refugee, you do have the ability to go back, but also because of technology. Yeah. Now, do you Skype with relatives back home? Do you, uh, you in, in touch on a regular basis? You're, uh, um, yeah, the WhatsApp, <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's the big one right now. Everybody well, use WhatsApp. Skype, you can see it. Yeah, and Skype, yes. Oh, what so. apps you can see it, too, mm -hmm. people, yeah. I uh, mean, my grandfather was out of touch with his family in Russia for 50 years. Mm. when he came to America. But as I say, he was a political refugee. You know, they were, they but today you can right. be in contact you in a very email, different way. You can email, you can call, yeah. you can write. Let me ask another question from the uh, audience. How can immigrants and their kids deal with assimilation educating Americans about their home country and their stories of their own? So we talked a lot about uh, the, the, the experience of becoming American, but what about what you can teach Americans about where you came from. <laughs> well, I'm not a statistic person, but I did hear one. <laughs> <laughs> you did hear, what was that? That, about, that it's, it's shocking. It's something like north of 90% of immigrants have never been invited into the home of Up a non-immigrant. Non uh, I did not know that. Yeah, That's it's it's a really shocking, and well, I don't know if it's exactly 90, but it was, it was a very yes. high number. And I think so. Start first starts with just, and you know, um, coming involved in people's lives who are different than, than mm -hmm. you are. Uh, they got to be engaged individually, politically, and, and also civically in order for them to integrate themselves into the social, economic, and political fabric of this community and this nation. Uh, uh, what about um, uh, the school system, the, the, uh, Rimberto, the role they can play in sort of bridging this gap that you're talking right, about? Right, but before the school system, actually, shout out here to, to our library friends, I mean, in Silver Spring Library has uh, storytelling in Am Amharic, and you go visit, and not all the children are, are from uh, Ethiopia, or the, the Long Branch Library storytelling in Spanish, not all the children uh, uh, are, are, are Latinos. So, so I think our institutions are, uh, are doing a, a very good job in, in bridging that gap and, 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 and sharing. And in, in, in the school system, uh, East Silver Spring Elementary School, for example, um, uh, nearly majority Ethiopian uh, student body uh, uses the opportunity. We just uh, um, had a major community meeting where the question is how can, how can people that don't have children uh, in the school system contribute to the school system? So be it mentoring, be it uh, sharing through mm -hmm. uh, social service clubs like the Rotary. It, it, so, so there is plenty of opportunity for, uh, I think we, we are fortunate to live in a county that welcomes that interaction. Here's another question, uh, uh, a short one. What's your fondest memory of your native country? <laughs> Food. <laughs> <laughs> what in particular, what do you miss? <laughs> well, I don't really miss anything because I, I, I lived here all my life here. But I think once in a while I get the urge to have spicy food. So, so that b brings me to the back of the, where I was born and I was raised in India in terms of the spicy curry food. But I you eat it. You miss the smells that, of your mother's kitchen? Um, well, uh, when I came here, uh, my mother passed away. So uh, the, she passed away at a very young age. But uh, not really. But uh, when I do eat it, uh, my stomach obviously cannot uh, stomach it anymore <laughs> 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 because I cannot eat spicy food anymore. Yeah, uh, that, that but, uh, but, talk but, about but assimilation. That's the downside <laughs> of assimilation. That's the downside. <laughs> As you get older, Steve, it's hard for you to digest the spicy food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm sure you could be you've, you've of that. become too American. <laughs> What's your fondest memory? Uh, two things, the warm springs and yeah. the weather, consistent weather, sunny weather. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, now, Florida. I, now I have come to appreciate the four seasons, but there is something about just sunshine for mm. most of the year. <laughs> yeah. 
There's a reason why people move to the sun. <laughs> yeah. uh, but what, what was the warm, you said warm springs? Mm -hmm. Did, uh, so these are that. just spring, natural springs that are warm and you could just go and swim. And they're open to the public? and it, it, It's not a park, it's just, they're just. And you went as a kid? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you got memories of that? Mm -hmm. Going with your family, going and with friends. And friends, yeah. yeah. Uh, some, uh, some, uh, again, I left as a child, so <laughs> but having gone back three times over the last three years is uh, something that I uh, um, dearly miss, is the opportunity to simply hang out. We don't do that enough. I mean, and, and so just, uh, and, and this is, it, it is, it's like people talking at a street corner, we're like, oh my God, what, what, are, what are they plotting? What are they doing? What? And so just the whole notion, we have tried to recreate some of that in Silver Spring, uh, uh, in the plaza, and people come together and just, Hang out and waste time, spend gossip. time. Is that what you like? And, and, and <laughs> in a good way. And and you don't see that here, while you see that in many of our countries. Yeah, back you're, home. You're, it's a very good point. I've any of us who've traveled abroad, I've lived in, in in Europe and in Greece, and those the custom of the evening uh, paseo or whatever. It's a different languages. It's all the same. Of, oh, it's always around food. It's <laughs> no, it's not always around food. It's always. It's, always, it's, a, it's, it's not. A, it's not always around food because it's also. A mating ritual, oh, uh, very it much is, so. It is uh, a ritual, uh, but they don't bring their wives and children and, and the women uh, in those parties and in, in those gossip. They usually the males. <laughs> All depends on the culture. It depends. Uh, but the well, especially uh, in Greece. But one of the things that you you point out that in the Latin culture certainly and the Mediterranean cultures, uh, this notion of gathering in public spaces, oh, have to. which Americans don't have, in part yeah. because we have backyards you know, and larger houses. And so people live within their own mm -hmm. fenced circle and don't use, if you go to a, a park in Montgomery County, right, you can hear dozens of foreign languages because immigrants are so much more used to using public spaces for social life. I remember one day I was in a, a Norwood Park in Bethesda and I heard a woman speaking, as I say, I've lived abroad, I was a foreign correspondent and I'm fairly familiar with strange languages and I heard a language I just, it was so <laughs> foreign to my ear that I finally was really rude and went up to her and said, what are you speaking? <laughs> and she said, Icelandic. Icelandic. <laughs> and that was not That's the answer I expected to hear, but it was, it was a perfect example of how uh, immigrants will use public spaces in ways that Native Americans do not. We and that enriches the community th with, with that use of the public space. We like our backyards, but the plaza's better. The plaza and the, and the parks, yeah, absolutely. Um, Here's a question. Uh, how do you envision the future of the uh, immigrant experience? Final question. The future. Where are we going? Hmm. You're not stumped. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, what's coming to mind is we live in a global world, and we've talked about how technology has kind of brought that world to, to all of us. So it will continue. It'll continue to grow. Let me, uh, uh, President Kennedy, uh, um, uh, quoted something in his book uh, in 1958 before he became a president. The immigrants infuses this nation with far horizons and new frontier, thereby keeping the hope alive and well. Mm -hmm. So immigrants are the future of America. They make this country great. So that's where we're going. We cannot live without the immigrants. They are part and parcel of our country, our community, our nation. But they define our character and conscience of this nation. That's the goal, and that's the principle, and that's the hope. But what about the obstacles that have been thrown up by the current administration? How can they be overcome? What effect will well, they have? Well, I think they'll, they'll, they'll have the effect of, uh, frankly, a, a lot of this, I'm working with a lot of young people and having been there with them in the marches, uh, they, they see beyond this. And, and, and the, the future, frankly, so uh, our grandson, our, our, our son's married to, to a young lady for, with German heritage. And so um, uh, he calls uh, uh, grandma and grandpa, uh, us, uh, abuela and abuelo. And he calls his uh, German uh, grandparents, opa and, uh, and omi. Uh, omi. Yeah. So I mean, how beautiful is that? And, yeah. and so that's, that's the future. Well, I, I, I think that the, uh, uh, I mean, it's a double standard. President Trump's two wives are uh, immigrants. His mother came as an immigrant. He had, had three, but two of them. Oh, oh yeah, well, the two of them were immigrants. And the, one of them also came an H-1 visa. So that's a double standard. So fact of the matter is, unless, uh, I think we have a bipartisan support on immigration for the skilled workforce, and the Senate has passed the bill, and if the, if the, if the Democrats take over the, uh, you know, the House, it is highly possible that we will pass the Comprehensive Immigration Reform Bill. And so, and that will solve a lot of problems that we have in our country. So. 
it's not just administration, Congress. We have to find a common cause uh, in order for us to move forward. If Final word for each of you. If you were to speak to Congress, which is deciding the future here, what's the most important thing you want them to know about the immigrant experience that would lead them to be more favorable, more open, more flexible in the immigrant policies? A fairly quick answer. Oh, that we are America, that they're looking at America, and that, and that, that is the most important thing. But how do you get them to listen to you? How do you get them to listen to you? Uh, we vote them out and we vote them in. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say? I would say we, we add value. And, you know, we, they, you know, if you're talking about Congress, they tend to think in terms of, you know, what contributions are we making? We contribute. We contribute to the economy. We contribute to the political life. We contribute to cultural life. We, we contribute. And what would you say? I agree with uh, everything they said. I said to the Congress uh, that uh, we, may, m we, in our, we cannot boost our competitiveness, our creativity, innovation, unless we welcome the skilled immigrant to this nation because they are part of the fabric of this nation. They define our character, our concepts of this nation, and they are the hope for tomorrow. They are the present and the past and the future of America. Good uh, note to end it on. Frank Islam, Ola Sage, and Roberto Rodriguez. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you all, for our audience here. All right. We appreciate that. I just want to remind everybody that this program is part of NEA Big Read, uh, Big Read Montgomery, and it was made possible by the National Endowment for the Arts in partnership. Another. Um, government program in trouble, National Department for the Arts, uh, and um, uh, we really appreciate you being here. Hope the rest of you have learned something about Montgomery County and this wonderful diverse county we call home. Uh, I'm Steve Roberts, and good night. Thanks for listening. Special thanks to our partners, Montgomery County Public Libraries, Friends of the Library Montgomery County, the Gaithersburg Book Festival, the Arts and Humanities Council of Montgomery County, Docs in Progress, Montgomery History, and Blessed Coffee.